Hey, Hammy here. Today we're going to be talking about Section 2 of Chapter 18, Modern Evolutionary Classification, where we will look at how are evolutionarily, evolutionary relationships used in classifying or grouping organisms. In evolutionary classification, uh, we're talking about phylogeny. Phylogeny is the study of evolutionary history of lineage. Okay, your lineage, your lineage is sort of your ancestry, your your heritage. I'm Andy's Milo's Rubens Arts Mark. Okay, that's my lineage, uh, going back through the generations. So if we trace organism species back through their father, mother, father, back, 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 and we kind of trace it back through history. And the goal, the goal of evolutionary classification is to group species into larger and larger categories that reflect evolutionary descent, rather than like we finished up in the last section looking at just physical, structural things that we see on the outside. Okay, so on the the little uh, phylogenic tree that you see over here on the right, <clears throat> you see that in this tree we're all it's all showing carnivores, car order carnivora. Okay, remember King Philip came over for good spaghetti, so we're looking at order here. Carnivora is then split into the family Felidae, okay, which are the felines or the cats. <clears throat> uh, the mustelids, mustelids are actually the largest family within the carnivores. Uh, this would include the skunks, otters, badgers, <clears throat> Wolverines, but we won't mention them, right? From the uh, good state of OH. Yes, that's right. Uh, and then over here are the canines. Okay, the canines would be our dog like creatures. And if you keep following up, you have the genus canine or canis, which is also canines, which are split into okay, the wolf canis lupus and the domestic dog, what we, all of our domestic dogs would be considered the same species, okay, they would be under Canis familiaris because they're familiar to us. They're our man's best friend, right? And so this is showing, this phylogenic tree is showing the relationships of, again, each point here could be a common ancestor and you keep tracing it back all the way back so you keep kind of narrowing it down but we see large groups large groups of organisms and how they can be grouped together based on common ancestry again the goal is to place organisms where they can be sort of grouped together based on certain characteristics okay those groups we're going to call clades okay clades are a group of species that include a single common ancestor. And we put them all together in something we call a cladogram. Okay, a cladogram is a chart that links groups of organisms by showing the lines or lineages of descent. Okay, so if you look over here on the cladogram, <clears throat> it's showing lines of descent. And at each split where we said before there's a common ancestor, that split is what we call a node. Okay, so this would be a node right here where that branch is. Okay, this whole chart would be showing vertebrates. Okay, this whole chart, these all have backbones. Okay. But as we go up, not all vertebrates have hair. Okay, so hair would be what we call a derived character. Okay, so that hair then is after hair is another node. And that next split, so everything inside this blue sort of square here has hair. Okay, as you travel up the cladogram, you'll see at the next node, okay, the next derived character that we're looking at is carnivores, meat eating. Okay, they have carnivorous rip flesh tearing teeth okay, like this where they can rip apart prey, meat. Okay, That would include all the dogs and the cats. Okay, If you keep traveling up the cladogram, the next node 
you see the derived character of retractable claws. Okay? Dogs cannot retract their claws. That's why when they come running to you on the hardwood floor, they come. you hear their nails, their claws skidding across the hardwood floor. Whereas cats can retract those claws. And we all know when they stretch on your lap and they stick them out, it hurts really bad. And so the last difference then between the leopard and the house cat is the ability to purr. That would be the last derived character. And this whole thing gives us clades or shows us how things are related in the past. Again, it all goes back to evolutionary relationships. It goes back to when was that common ancestor? Well, when was that split? And now we're adding in derived characters. What is the difference between those organisms after that split? Okay, again, just another example of a cladogram. Uh, just showing tetrapods, different clades. Clade tetrapods, uh, amniota, mam mammals, mammalia, carnivores, and felines. So a very similar cladogram. Uh, this is the one that is, this is the one that's in your notes. Uh, and again, you'll see that there are different derived characters, okay? All organisms that have four limbs, and that at each node, okay? point out some keywords here at each node is a branch off of each other okay where there's a common ancestor here and they branch off and so each clade consists of a single common ancestor at each node it, there's a branch and you also see derived characters uh, some of the same kinds of things that we saw in our last cladogram uh, so make sure you take a special note of this diagram in your notes and highlight and mark down some of these important terms. Finally, uh, how do we come up with the cladograms? Again, in the end of the last video, we talked about using structural similarities uh, and the problems with that, how sometimes things look very much the same just in appearance, just a, a quick observation of two organisms. But as you begin to look at more in-depth characteristics, we see that it's not always so cut and dry. Uh, one of the, the tricks that scientists had, or, or I guess I should say difficult things that they really debated about, is where the pandas go. Okay, the red pandas and the giant pandas um, in Asia. Are they, are they bears or are they raccoons? And there was a lot of debate over this over the years until we started doing DNA testing. Because as we've talked about in the last couple chapters, as over time mutations build up in DNA and a species branch off from each other, those differences in DNA become greater and greater and greater. And we see that we did a lab with amino acids, amino acid differences. And so the more differences you see, the you know further away that common ancestor is. Okay, so we these mutations in the DNA can be treated as derived characters and they help us make the cladograms. Okay? This helps make cladistics more accurate. Uh, for example, when scientists started working with the red pandas, giant pandas, they found that the red panda was actually a closer relative to what we would know as the raccoon family, would be an animal we're familiar with around here. And the giant panda was more similar to the bear family. So when they set up the cladogram, okay, here's one common ancestor a long time ago down here. Okay. Uh, the red pandas split off in this direction towards the raccoons. Uh, and then the bears were split off in this direction. And then there was another common ancestor where there was a split between the giant panda and the bear. Okay. So DNA helps scientists get a better picture when there's confusion and maybe physical similarities don't always give us a clear picture. DNA analysis can help us sort out and group those organisms. That concludes short section 18.2. I hope you learned a little something today and we'll see you in the next segment.